This is episode 4 of Amos chapter 2. So here's Amos up here. He's a contemporary of Jonah. Remember Jonah and the whale and Hosea. And he's preaching to the north. So here we have King Saul, David and Solomon. And under David and Solomon we had a united kingdom which then broke up after the death of Solomon. And God sent all these prophets and Elijah and Elisha was over here as well under Ahab uh, to preach to the north, northern kingdom. Israel and tell them, yes, Israel, and tell them to behave because otherwise judgment will come. Of course, they didn't listen. So Amos was active around 760 to 753 BC, just seven years in total. He preached during the rule of King Uzziah of Judah, who reigned 52 years, and here's Uzziah here, and Jeroboam the second of Israel uh, here. Uh, who reigned for 41 years. So the reigns of the two kings overlapped by about 15 years. And the north and the south were at the zenith of their power. They both experienced national stability, prosperity, and the expansion of their kingdoms. The layout of Amos illustrated key idea, judgment comes regardless. And a primary biblical principle is that our holy God judges sin. And a secondary biblical principle is that God will stay his judgment if we truly repent and change our ways. So we did chapter 1, which was uh, the three enemies of Israel and then the three cousins of Israel. We covered those. And now we're doing chapter 2, which is Judah and Israel themselves. And then having dealt with the neighboring Gentile nations, Amos now turns his attention to Judah and Israel. So this is a recap of chapter 1 if you want to read it. It's uh, chapter 1a was Aram. These are the enemies of Israel. And then chapter 1b were the cousins of Israel, Edom, Ammon, and Moab. And they were all judged. So you can pause at this point and read this if you need a refresher. So let's dive into chapter 2. Judah and Israel judged. So judgment on Judah. Notice there's only two verses on Judah's punishment, but 11 verses on Israel. I'm starting at verse 4 because the judgment of Moab was at the end of chapter 1. Remember I tacked it on there because Moab, Edom, Ammon, and Moab, although this is in chapter 2, I put it into this one so that the three cousins would be together. So here I'm starting on, on verse 4. Also remember that Amos came from Judah, so the northerners didn't mind listening to his judgment on their sister nation. In fact, they probably thoroughly approved and are still listening all ears. And Judah's guilt differed from that of the heathen nations because their sin was directly against God, not just against man. And because Judah knew better, yet they knowingly violated God's commandments. So verse 4, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments. Their lies lead them astray, lies which their fathers followed, because they have despised the law of the Lord. At this time, Judah's king Isaiah reigned, and his political influence was felt as far down as Egypt. So here's Judah and here's Egypt. So he con his, his influence was all the way down there. Um, and 2 Kings tells us that he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, except that the high places were not removed and the people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, which were considered the pagan places. In the Christian Bibles, the name of God, Yahweh, is dumbed down to hear just the Lord. So here we just said despise the law of the Lord. We dumbed it down. But in the Hebrew Bible, the actual inclusion of the name Yahweh has great meaning. Because then there was no ambivalence as to which God was being referred to. In the ancient Near East, gods had names, and pronouncing a god's name was critical to its identity. Judah practiced idolatry with hundreds of false gods, so it's important to know exactly who's turning on them. It's Yahweh, Judah's own one true God. The destruction of the temple was a chilling recognition that the nation had angered a jealous God. The southern kingdom knew the Old Testament law is holy and just and righteous, yet they despised the law of Yahweh by not keeping it. They knew how God wanted them to behave and had sworn to keep the Mosaic Covenant when they left Egypt and reached Mount Sinai around 1446 BC. 
Now it's around 760 BC. And who keeps a covenant for nearly 700 years? Well, God does. He said he would bless them if they kept his covenant, and he was still faithfully blessing them. But for hundreds of years, the faithless South had broken their side of the bargain. And Uzziah, King Uzziah broke a specific law when the prideful king contemptuously usurped the authority of the priests. In 2 Chronicles 26 we read, But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up. In other words, he was prideful. His heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Only a Levite was allowed to offer incense because incense was seen as the nation's prayers ascending to heaven as the smoke and scent filled the sanctuary. Because of Isaiah's sinful overreach, God struck Isaiah with leprosy and his son Jotham took over his royal duties. Don't get in front of an angry God and have not kept his commandments. It was not Judah's lack of faith in God that brought judgment. It was the consequence of breaking his laws. This brought divine wrath upon Judah. Leviticus 26, God says, But if you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgments, so that you do not perform all my commandments, but break my covenant, I also will do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you, wasting disease and fever, which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. So Jesus said the law and the prophets, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So Jesus was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets in Matthew 5, 17. Notice that God did not judge any of the heathen nations on the basis of despising his laws. Not one. Why? Because they didn't know the Old Testament law. So God didn't judge them by that. He judged them purely on natural law. Man's inhumanity to man. But God would judge Judah on breaking his law because they knew better. And Judah's judgment came in 586 BC when the Babylonians burned Jerusalem raised the temple, and took them captive to Babylon for 70 years. Later, the Medes and Persians overran Babylon, and Cyrus the Great allowed them to return to Jerusalem and rebuild it after the 70 years of captivity, which is what Jeremiah prophesied. An additional judgment was that the Israelites would be dispersed and scattered throughout the world, and they were, until May 48, when Israel once again became a nation-state, and God started regathering his people Back to the promised land. I love this New York Times headline. It says, Zionists proclaim new state of Israel. Truman recognizes it and hopes for peace. Followed by Tel Aviv is bombed and Egypt orders invasion. Well, that peace didn't last for long, did it? Their lies lead them astray. Lies which their fathers followed. They rejected the laws of God, and in their place they put the lies of men, the lies of fake priests who condone bowing to false gods. Over time, evil had acquired a patina of authority as the priests promoted their vile idolatry. And the sins of the sons followed the lies of their fathers. For many successive generations, Judah ignored all the warnings of all the prophets sent by God. Verse 5. But I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. I will send a fire. In 586 BC, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the citadels of Jerusalem by pulling down its towers with ropes. The temple of Solomon was torn down, burned, and the city itself razed. The treasures of the temple were looted and taken to Babylon. Devour the palaces. Palaces here means fortresses, citadels, or high towers. So the temple was seen as God's home on earth. So while the city itself was burned, the fact that the temple was destroyed would have been on every Jewish mind. No temple meant nowhere for the Levite priest to offer sacrifices for the atonement of Judah's sins. Nowhere to burn incense. Nowhere to be ritually cleansed. Nowhere to dedicate their firstborn to God. Or circumcise them. Nowhere for God to dwell on earth. This was a catastrophe. God used the Babylonians to punish Judah 
and they went into captivity for 70 years. Once they were released by Cyrus the Great and returned to Judah, they never again bowed to false idols. They had learned their lessons. God would not be a fair and just God if he condemned other nations for their sin, but did not also judge his own people for their sin. God is impartial that way. He has no favorites when it comes to judgment. That applies to us today. Judgment on Israel. Finally, Amos homes in on his real mission, the north. The northern kingdom was at the zenith of its power, and Jeroboam III extended his borders to encroach on Syria and to reclaim Israel's land east of the River Jordan. That was uh, Ammon and Moab. This gave Israel control over trade routes, which enriched the nation. Commerce thrived, and upper middle class emerged, expensive homes were built, and many people had second summer homes. The rich enjoyed an indulgent lifestyle, but standards of morality sank to a new low. They ignored the law of Moses because they found it oppressive. But religion flourished as the people mixed their feasts and festivals with erotic paganism. It was a glorious, boisterous time, and the people lived deliciously. It's interesting that God had to go to Tekoa in the south to find a righteous man to rebuke the north. That doesn't say much for the northerners. Yet the north ignored Amos' warnings because they still maintained that they were the chosen people and God would never harm them. They considered themselves immune from disaster and judgment. And so they were shocked when Amos grouped them and their impending judgment with their enemies. David Parson splits the rest of this chapter of the judgment on Israel into the three R's. They had become insensitive to God's present righteousness, insensitive to God's past redemption when he saved them before, and insensitive to God's, God's future retribution, his future judgment. So, number one, they had become insensitive to God's present righteousness. Verse six, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. They sell the righteous for silver. Israel's sins revealed the general moral decay and insensitivity of the nation. Their wealth had made them indifferent and so drunk with power that they deliberately exploited the poor legally and economically. Judges could be bribed with a few pieces of silver. Money talked. Even today we had that young man that worked for um, BlackRock that said you can buy a senator's vote for just $10,000. Just $10,000 and you can buy a senator's vote. That's what that young man said. He was caught, you know, on a hot mic. Uh, money talked. Righteous in this sense implies innocence of any crime. And the righteous who didn't even have a debt were taken into slavery to ostensibly pay for this non-existent debt. God allowed bond servitude to pay off a debt, but Israel was human trafficking their own people for profit, for silver. They sell the righteous for silver. They blatantly violated the foundational principle of love your neighbor as yourself. Israel was breaking the Old Testament law and God's moral and social code too. Leviticus 25, And if one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor, and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a slave. As a hired servant and sojourner, he shall be with you until the year of Jubilee, in which case you have to write off the debt altogether. 2 Kings 4. A certain woman cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. That's horrible. God has always had a heart for the helpless, and especially little children. Exodus 22, we read, You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If you afflict them in any way, and they cry at all to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will become hot, and I will kill you with a sword. Your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. And today, modern human trafficking is being revealed, especially the abomination of millions of children around the world that are trafficked every year millions of children for sexual depravity, for adrenochrome, 
for the horrific sacrifice to Satan and for organ harvesting while the child is still alive. What must God be thinking? Well, Jesus tells us in Luke 17, it would be better for him if a millstone was hung around his neck and he was thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. It's millstone time, guys. We're doing this with millions of children every year. It's millstone time. They sell the poor for a pair of sandals. There was a massive disparity between the haves and the have-nots. There was a contempt for human dignity and the poor were being victimized. When someone became indebted to another, they would take his cloak or his sandals as collateral. If they took a person's sandals, it implied that the debt was just a small, paltry debt. Yet the sandalless one had to walk barefoot, which was a public, humiliating acknowledgement that he was being treated as a slave, because only slaves walk barefoot. They took a man's coat as collateral. Now the indebted one had nothing to keep him warm or cover him at night. And God decried these social and moral injustices. Verse 7. They pant after the dust of the earth which is on the head of the poor and pervert the way of the humble. A man and his father go into the same girl to defile my holy name. They pant after. The image here is like an animal on the hunt, sniffing the ground as it chases its prey. So are the wicked in pursuit of their helpless victims. There is unrelenting cruelty towards the weak and poor. They are only to be used for pleasure and profit. Just such utter demeaning of humanity when they are only to be used for pleasure or profit. Throughout the ancient Near East, the kings were supposed to defend such people, not exploit them. But the northern leadership had abandoned that moral requirement. The poor were just there to be preyed on, on the head of the poor. This is another expression to make the point that the wealthy treat the poor as underdogs, just dirt, not worthy of human respect. Pervert the way of the humble. The Hebrew interpretation is that when the wealthy rode past, their carriages forced the poor and humble off the road. Another interpretation is that the rich stand in the way of progress, hindering any improvement of the humble. And additionally, the poor are denied justice in the courts of law. So any way you slice this, the rich harass and impede the poor. A man and his father go into the same girl. Amos was accusing the entire nation of this sin. So clearly this sexual immorality was widespread and openly practiced. This forbidden lust violates the girl who may be just indentured for a debt, yet she is treated as the family whore. And this greatly offends God. The Lord required that if there were sexual relations with the girl, then marriage was obligatory. Exodus 22. If a man entices a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall surely pay the bride price for her to be his wife. And for a father and son to both have sexual relations with the same girl or woman was strictly forbidden and explained in Leviticus 18. There were consequences for violating God's sexual purity laws, Leviticus 20. This depravity mandated death. To defile my holy name. Not only are these sins offensive to God, but these acts seem to be deliberate. They are knowingly despising God's holy name. God will forgive accidental sin, but not intentional sin. Numbers 15. And if a person sins unintentionally, then he shall bring a female goat in its first year as a sin offering, so that the peace shall make atonement for the person who sins unintentionally, and it shall be forgiven him. Even by virtue of natural law, we know when we deliberately lie, steal, cheat, covet, or murder, there is a knowing that we have stepped over a line. God treats deliberate sin as an act of rebellion. Numbers 15. But the person who does anything presumptuously, whether he is native born or a stranger, that one brings reproach on the Lord, and he shall be cut off from among his people, ostracized. Because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment, that person shall be completely cut off. His guilt shall be upon him. Verse 8. They lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge and drink the wine of the condemned in the house of the Lord. 
How disrespectful is that? You lie on the clothes that you've taken in pledge. You don't put them away safely. You lie on them. They lie down by every altar. The powerful rich brazenly flaunted their ill-gotten gains and even had sex in places supposed to be holy. The northern king had made up his own false religion to stop the people going to worship in Jerusalem in the south. Jeroboam the first placed altars and the golden calves in both Bethel and Dan. The north's own man-made religion was a less judicial theology, a more convenient and appealing morality. They developed their own pagan traditions, but enjoyed God's ordained feasts and festivals, one big party. They preferred the lies of their own appointed priests rather than the truth from God's anointed priests. Notice the difference, God's anointed priests and their own appointed priests. So they, these were not of the Levi tribe. They were just <clears throat> people that said they would go along with their paganism. So their lying priests preached this new lustful standard, this new morality, this wayward lifestyle. And the people lapped it up. Their priests assured them that irrespective of their behavior, they were still God's chosen people. And they definitely didn't want to listen to Amos, the prophet of doom. On clothes of pledge. According to Mosaic law, if you take a garment as a pledge that some act will be done, you cannot keep the garment past sunset because the owner of the garment needs it to keep himself warm at night. Exodus 22. If you ever take your neighbor's garment as a pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering. It's his garment for his skin. What will he sleep in? And it will be that when he cries to me, I will hear, for I am gracious. But God is not gracious to the offender that took the garment as pledge. To God, a lack of compassion is an offense. Look at the difference between the haves and the have-nots. Drink the wine of the condemned. The wicked falsely claimed damages. So exorbitant and unnecessary fines were imposed by corrupt judges on the condemned. And the wicked celebrated and got drunk on their winnings and lay down on the garments that they'd taken. In the house of their God, the unrighteous gave credit to their many gods for the unholy act and celebrated their successes at the feet of their false gods. So now verses 19 and 11 will elaborate the favor that God answered on his people yet got no credit for it. So firstly, verses 6 to 8, they had become insensitive to God's present righteousness. They exploited the poor, took their garments and sandals as collateral. A father and son lusted after the same girl and violated her. And they gave credit to their false gods for their wealth and success. So now they had become insensitive to God's past redemption. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before you, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was as strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots beneath. Yet it was I. Jericho was the capital of the Amorites. God is reminding them who was actually responsible for their military success against a nation of large and powerful men and a well-fortified city with its double walls. Yet despite this, the northerners are attributing their military might to Baal. They don't give God the glory, the honor, or the praise. Not at all. They are too busy bowing before their man-made golden calves. The term Amorite could also refer to all enemies in general that God has helped them overcome. The implication here is the total ingratitude of the people. They were a uniquely blessed people and especially favored, but they didn't appreciate who truly granted them their blessings. Almighty God intervened in their battles destroyed their enemies to give them success, yet they deliberately gave credence to a false god. So look at Jericho back in the day, and look at it today. Unreal. So the people had height like the cedars, strong as oaks. Cedars grow to be 70 to 80 feet high. So God is illustrating that like the Philistines, the Amorites were a race of giants, and with their height came massive strength. Yet God destroyed them. I will destroy the fruit above and his roots beneath. That is, God destroyed the Amorites totally and utterly. There was no next generation of Amorites. Look at this, Jericho, today. Verse 10. 
Also, it was I who brought you up out from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorites. It was I. We all know the story of Moses and the exodus from Egypt and 400 years of bondage. God is reminding the north who brought them safely out of slavery and lovingly cared for them. While they were in the wilderness, there was no sickness. Their clothes and shoes lasted indefinitely and they had water in the desert. God freed them from bondage and he nurtured his people, but clearly they have forgotten his mercy and grace. Led you 40 years. When Moses sent 12 spies into Canaan to spy out the land, once they returned, they refused to go in and fight for the promised land because of the size of the Philistine giants. Only Caleb and Joshua were willing to fight. The rest refused. So God made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years as that generation died off. And yet God provided for them all that time in the wilderness and then miraculously helped them overcome all the tribes in Canaan as the Israelites took possession of the promised land. Verse 11. I raised up some of your sons as prophets and some of your young men as Nazarites. Is it not so, O you children of Israel, says the Lord? I raised up some of your sons. Prophets are God's faithful spokesmen. God revealed himself to his chosen as no other nation had ever experienced. He raised his sons as prophets to reveal God's plans for his people, both good and bad. God is constantly trying to woo us back into a covenant relationship with him. One minister said that from Genesis, when Adam fell, to Revelation and Jesus' second coming, God just wants a relationship with us. He wants us to be his family. That's why he created us in the first place. Unlike the angels, we have free will, which is what mostly gets us into trouble. God says, don't do that, and we do it anyway. Your young men as Nazarites. These young men were outside the priesthood and were singled out as a special gift to the people to demonstrate faithfulness. And Nazarite was a man who voluntarily took on a vow, as described in number six, to one, abstain from grape products like wine or even vinegar or raisins, to never cut their hair, and three, to never come in contact with a corpse or graves, which would make them ritually impure. And it doesn't even apply to family. If one of your family members died, you couldn't uh, go anywhere near them. So if they accidentally became impure, they had to offer an animal sacrifice and restart their Nazarite period from the beginning. A Nazarite was declared he who vowed or holy unto God for the designated time period. And this duration was determined per individual. After following these requirements, they would offer animal sacrifices and their hair would be cut and burned. And this completed their vow. So Samson and Samuel were two people who were Nazarites. While Samson was explicitly commanded to be a Nazarite, see, he never cut his hair and that's how Jezebel uh, uh, sorry, and that's how Delilah uh, took away his strength was by cutting his hair. So while Samson was explicitly commanded to be a Nazarite in Judges 13, the word Nazarite was not used regarding the prophet Samuel. Rather, he was given to the Lord and forbidden to cut his hair. So the story of Samuel, we all know the story of Samson and Delilah, but the story of Samuel is his mother was, in a, was barren. And she was in the temple praying and she said, God, if you give me a child, I'll give him back to you. And so she did. She fell pregnant and had Samuel. And when he was three years old, when they weaned him, she brought him to the temple to be brought up. As a toddler of three years, his mother took Samuel to the temple to serve as an acolyte, as an assistant to the high priest Eli. So, and Samuel grew up to be a mighty prophet and guided the first king, Saul. But Saul preferred to do his own thing, so God stripped his kingdom away from him and gave it to David. So when when she used to come back every so often and bring new clothes for him as he grew. But, you know, it's not like little Samuel was brought up by a bunch of old, old men because the Jewish people married and still do. Their rabbis, their teachers, and their priests marry and have children. And so this little toddler would have been nurtured by one of the priest's wives and he had all their children to play with so it's uh well you know he's separated from his mother but it's not like he's in a vacuum being brought up and taught by a bunch of old men he was in a the temple was a compound for the priests and their families 
So, verse 12. But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophet, saying, Do not prophesy. So the people were uncomfortable with the example set by the faithful love that the Nazarites lived. So they cajoled them into breaking their vow. They had uttered disdain for the purposes of God, commanded the prophet, saying, Do not prophesy. They were equally uncomfortable with being reminded of their many sins and their impending judgment because of it. So they shut the mouths of their prophets, throttled their speech, censored their message. What does that sound like today, huh? Verse 13. Behold, I am weighed down by you as a cart full of sheaves is weighed down. An overloaded cart will crush anything beneath its wheels. God is speaking here through Amos, saying he's weighed down. His patience is stressed to breaking point. Judgment on wicked Israel is not just a threat. It is certain. It will come to pass. Nothing can stop what is coming. In the past, God had fought on their behalf, but no more. So they had become insensitive to God's present righteousness, to his past redemption. It just, God destroyed their enemies for them. He brought them out of bondage and he raised up examples of how you're supposed to live for them. And so this was his past redemption. And now they'd become insensitive to God's future retribution, to his judgment, coming judgment. Verse 14. Therefore flight shall perish from the swift. The strong shall not strengthen his power, nor shall the mighty deliver himself. The swift, the strong, and the mighty. The swift can't run fast enough, and the strong cannot withstand the onslaught, and they're not militarily mighty enough to escape judgment. They are not strong enough to stand their ground, or even escape, even if it is expected of them. There's no hope for the nation. Notice that the full armor of God, as in Ephesians 6, protects from the front. So you've got the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, and the gospel of peace, and of course your field of faith. So these are all front, frontal attack protections. Christians are not meant to turn their backs on the battle when warring with Satan. You can't turn your back on Satan and run because your whole back is exposed. All your defense is from the front. So you fight from the front as a Christian. Well, as a warrior, like that too. None of the, you were never meant to run. Verse 15. He shall not stand who handles the bow. The swift of foot shall not escape. Nor shall he who rides a horse deliver himself. So we have bow, swift of foot, rides a horse. Ephraim was the most powerful tribe and had horses. They actually had a cavalry, which was very unusual back in the day for the Israelites. So Ephraim was the most powerful tribe. And so the Bible often refers to the entire northern kingdom simply as Ephraim. Yet now the north does not have the capability to save themselves. Neither their bowmen, nor their foot soldiers, nor their cavalry can save them. They cannot survive what's coming. And within 40 years, the Assyrians attacked overwhelmed the Israelites and took them away to captivity. And the northern kingdom ceased to exist as a distinct people. They were so evil, God took them out. Verse 16, The most courageous men of might shall flee naked in that day, says the Lord. Shall flee naked, there's no turning away God's wrath. Even the mightiest among them will flee and run so fast they won't even take the time to get dressed. In that day. So Joel, Joel was the first one to speak about in that day, the great judgment day, the day of the Lord, that day, God's final conquest, the battle of Armageddon, when all will be wiped out. So in summary for Israel's judgment, uh, they become insensitive to God's present righteousness. They exploited the poor, took their garments and sandals. Father and son lusted after the same girl, and they gave credit to their fault God for their successes. They were insensitive to God's past redemption, where he destroyed their Amorites for them. He brought them out of slavery and continued to look after them and nurture them and give them examples of how to live. They become insensitive to God's future retribution, his future judgment. They can't run fast enough to get away. Their military can't withstand it, and even the most courageous will run naked in fear. So the overall message we should note is, if Damascus, Gaza, and Tyre did not escape, that's the enemies, if Edom 
Ammon and Moab did not escape, these were their cousins, or bloodline, if Judah and Israel did not escape, what makes us think today that we will escape God's judgment for our sin? What makes us think we'll be absolved? We will be judged. So this is the end of episode 4, chapter 2. Judah and Israel is judged. God is going to judge everything we do, whether it's good or bad, even things done in secret. Ecclesiastes 12, 14. Everything. Today, a lot of the sin, well, I guess historically, every time, man likes to sin in the dark, sin in private. And today, the sins in private are horrific. But everything is going to be exposed, whether good or bad. And Jesus wept three times, actually, in the Bible. He wept the first time at Lazarus' death. He wasn't weeping for the fact that Lazarus died, but he was weeping for the sisters because he knew this, uh, the destruction of, uh, of women back in the day when their men, their husband or their sons, were taken from them. second time he cried was when he entered Jerusalem on a donkey and he knew the fate of Jerusalem to come, that, they would all, that the city would be burned. And the third time he wept blood, actually, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he had to, he knew what was he had to go through for the next few days. Horrible, because even though he was 100% divine God, he was also living in a 100% human body. So let me bless you before you go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you. God bless you. Shalom. Please join me for episode 5.